couple of years, uh, sociologists at the University of Southampton have been working with our colleagues in computer science um, on a number of projects which we call we bring together under the heading of web science. And in particular, we've written a couple of papers in sociology where we explore some of the challenges that the current um, data deluge, as Savage and Burroughs have called it, pose for sociology as a discipline. And the background to all of that, of course, is that we're living in a time where, that people refer to as a time of big data, where we're seeing more and more data being produced all the time, digital data and digital traces about the world around us. And it's partly the scale of those data which is very challenging. What are we going to do with all of these data? How are we going to engage with all of these data? But it's also the nature of the data. This is somewhat different data from the kinds of data that sociologists are used to, to using and working with. Um, partly it's real-time data. It's real-time data that's collected over time. And although it does tell us things that we're used to seeing data about, so it tells us about demographics or it tells us epidemiological information about health and populations, it's also giving us a real insight into the world that we're not used to having, some really different kinds of data. At one level, the era of big data is really, really exciting for sociology, but at another level, it poses some pretty big challenges for us as a discipline, do you think, Kathy? Yeah, I think it does. I think it's been really interesting to think about what those methodological challenges are, because it moves us away from that first-hand experience of collecting data often retrospectively, looking at records people have created or interviewing them about things that they believe and, and attitudes that they have. And it allows us to do that real-time thing and it allows us to look at um, phenomena at scale. So we've had some really quite profound conversations that have been simply, how do we ask questions about these data? What kind of question would a computer scientist ask and what kind of question would a sociologist ask and how, how can we answer them? We kind of end up asking new questions that perhaps neither of those disciplines yeah. would have started out asking. So this isn't just a case of adding together you know, sociology as usual with your computer science as usual. This is about doing something that, that's really quite different and quite difficult and challenging. One of the first um, ways in which we really started to get into depth with that was the paper that we wrote in 2013, which was a paper that explored the implications of the emergent semantic web, or the web of linked data as sometimes people refer to it, for sociology. We had questions about what on earth was this semantic web, and, and Mark had questions of us about how could we understand that in, in more sociological and epistemological terms. Traditionally you'd think of the web as being a series of documents with links in and you can f click on the links and read the next document. Um, and it's like a, a large library designed for people to read. And inside those documents there's all sorts of data, um, but it wasn't really accessible to the machines. The people could read it, but um, it wasn't described in a, in a way that made it useful to process in other ways. And so the semantic web is a, about trying to um, bring out that data and, and present it in a form that it can be reused and repurposed in different ways. And at the heart of it, um, you have this thing called a URI, which is a, a sort of unique reference for identifying concepts or, or particular things within the semantic web. And then when people prepare their data sets in a semantic web form, they're um, you reusing these URIs, so they're linking to other people's data as they construct their data sets. But obviously one of the things you need to think about is how you, how you prepare this data. Um, we had a number of discussions about the terminology around this, so words like ontology get used within the semantic web in a way that's probably quite different to, to how it's used in other contexts. And so what we're looking at is potential ways of, of linking data in, in new and different ways to the traditional way where you might link a data set on um, names and there's, there's all sorts of issues associated with that um, but it doesn't just have to be names now it could be any sort of concept that's been tagged with a URI and, and identified as something unique that can be referred to in another data set and so it's a large resource that's potentially being assembled could provide new forms of of, of data for interrogation and answering new types of questions potentially. Mm. So a lot of this is really quite technical because it is about this prospective preparation of the data and it's mm. about building tools that allow the machines to read different kinds of descriptions of data 
And it's something that I've come to realise people in computer science are talking about. It's a big, big research agenda in computer science. And it's a very ambitious agenda because really it's about the next generation web. It's about changing the web of documents into a web of data. And I became really interested in that when I heard somebody who was very, very excited and enthusiastic talking about it, um, you know, about how we were going to rationalise the world's data into a semantic web. And my immediate reaction was to be quite horrified, to be honest. I thought, oh my goodness, you know, the world's data, and I was at that point perhaps a little bit taken in by the enthusiasm for it, but the, the world's data is going to be rationalised according to some ontologies that are going to be built by computer scientists driven by very technical questions um, and trying to make systems that would function very effectively and fast and be really impressive in a technical way. But as a sociologist, it really, really bothered me that the web you know, that we use all the time and increasingly are dependent on to find out information about things was going to be restructured so that behind the scenes there was going to be this whole layer that described what kinds of entities existed in the world, what the relationships between them were, and what kinds of questions almost you could ask about that, by default at least. And I, I became really concerned about the epistemological and ontological issues that were involved in that. And I thought, my goodness, you know, we need to have a, a critical perspective on this, to think about um, those questions that are very sociological questions. You can prove semantic linked data techniques by doing transport timetables or looking at estates um, information as we do in this university. But actually, potentially, we could ask some really, really big questions um, about class, about health, about gender, about place, about any of those really big concepts that sociologists um, are very, very concerned with. So social media, for instance, are another example of big data that sociologists have been really interested in and about which we might have lots and lots of questions. They're one of these new types of data at scale, real time, over time, all of those kinds of things. Mm. Well, the interesting thing about um, social media data, so Twitter, for example, uh, you know, Twitter as a phenomenon that you know, kind of appeared on the, the scene six years ago, it's very much tied up with the development of the web, not only in terms of what people call Web 2, about user contributions, but also in terms of whole new classes of hardware becoming available in smartphones and things like that, and, and radical changes in people's behaviour. People sharing intimate details of their lives just uh, in the open, um, and, be, and us being able to come along and, and observe that and to see what people are saying uh, in the wild, not prompted by you know, sort of researchers' clever questioning. It's, it's very interesting as well because it's, it's so accessible for us as researchers. Um, there are technical ways, for a number of technical ways for us to, to get at that information feed and to try and make use of it. Now, the, pr the problem for us as computer scientists, just with a computer scientist hat on, is that we know how to, to make use of those feeds and we know how to build big databases which capture all of this information. We really need to engage with uh, some deep and fundamental methodological improvements for us to know how to push through, uh, not just look at the Twitter data, at this big data, but to interpret what it means and what it tells us about the real lives of our real societies yeah. underneath. Um, so what the computer scientists bring to the table, I think, is some of the techniques that allow us to engage with these data, but perhaps what they're less good at bringing to the table is some of the more sociological questions, because what's exciting about these data really for most people is that they tell us something about the social. Mm -hmm. But what we're less good at as sociologists is apprehending these data. So the second paper that we wrote on Twitter um, started from that position which it really said that the social sciences potentially could make some fantastic use out of social media data but at the moment we didn't really have the tools to do that. And I think we also raised some questions, however, about the ethics of doing that, because one of the things Les was just talking about was, you know, we can get these incredibly intimate details about people's lives, but there's a really big question about should we? Um, I think that the, the ethical issues are quite profound, and once we started working with Twitter data, we realised just, you know, really what a can of worms we'd opened up, because the illusion is that all these data are public, that you can harvest them, you know, however you like, and there are some issues, as you've said, about sampling from them because only some people have access to all of the Twitter data. Um, and 
we had all sorts of, um, you know, sleepless nights really about that because as social scientists we go through these elaborate procedures uh, where we ask people for their consent, we tell them exactly how the data are going to be collected and so there were huge issues for us about how we use these data and we're aware that we haven't really reached a point where anyone understands what best practice is for how we ethically um, analyse these data. So one of the things ab about these data in particular is this real-time overtime thing and the fact that it links very closely, I think, with some of the sociolog sociological work around mobilities and flows, some of the network society sociology, and yet we didn't seem to have the methods that would allow us to engage with these data as dynamic data, as unfolding over time, as data which might tell us something about how the social is emerging out of the actions of, for instance, tweeting and connecting with another person by retweeting. And so that was one of the reasons that we worked together on developing um, and interpreting this, this new tool um, for engaging with Twitter data. Ramin, do you want to say yeah, it's, no, it's yours, not ours? Oh, no, that's <laughs> absolutely right. I think what, what you've just you sort of stepped upon is, is saying how we, from the computer science perspective, you're very much in the kind of line of let's count and let's, do, let's put stuff in buckets, do positive and negative. But we were interested in how roles emerge from the network and how the network itself is something that's interesting and the communications and the actual patterns that we're seeing is not just patterns, it's people interacting. So, sort of Flow 140, the tool that we were developing, and, and the kind of the approach that came out of this is allowing us to um, look beyond just the network itself, look at the micro and the macro, look at how people interact and what they're actually doing, but also look at how network roles and looking at how people, the interactions, allow their role to emerge from the network. In the paper that we did for the, the actual student protest, we looked at how different types of information was being spread to different communities and how. Um, the actual the ability of using this tool allowed us to interrogate the data beyond just the network structure but actually look in depth at what kind of roles were emerging between mm -hmm. the communities and who were actually the ones talking and, um, and it provided us a new perspective but beyond that it's it's the ability to look at this kind of data as a wide data is, is beyond the kind of online methods of saying just one social network, Facebook or Twitter, whatever it might be, but we want to use these, especially in web sciences, these methods of online and offline interrogation and how we really understand human action as well as what we see through the digital traces. Good. And I think that's what's really different about Flow 140 because although I think sometimes people look at, look at this, it's just gone off now, sometimes people look at it and they see standard network modelling, which it's based on the principles of social network mm. analysis, but it's actually trying to do something different with that. In the paper, we look at which pieces of information flowed most quickly mm. over time and uh, between which kinds of communities. Yeah. So it's really... For us, I think, it's a really exciting example of web science because it does genuinely to try to harness the sociological and the computational mm. to say something that's web sciencey about social networks. And I think for us, probably speaking for all of us, that's just the beginning. So we've written these, these two papers in sociology, which we're really proud of. Um, but we think there's a pretty enormous research agenda out there that we can develop built on this Absolutely. collaboration that's taken quite a while to get going, mm. but now it's going. We feel there's a lot, lot of other things that we can do. Mm.